Sources have told the BBC the Prime Minister said he would rather let thousands of bodies pile high in the streets than have another lockdown. Boris Johnson was on a trip to Wrexham today. He insists he didn't make the comments, though, in October last year. No, uh, but uh, again, I think the important thing I think that people want to, uh, us to get on and do as a, a government is to make sure that the, the lockdowns work. Another day of damaging claims, another day of denial, another day when the government's having to defend the Prime Minister's conduct itself. And Labour called the PM's comments a disgrace and a new low. Also tonight, Iran sentences Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe to another year in prison, dashing hopes she'd be coming home. In India, doctors say people are dying from COVID in the streets, while desperate families queue to buy their own oxygen. Restrictions ease further in Scotland as restaurants, pubs and bars welcome customers indoors, but only till 8pm. Paris, they don't even speak English there. And after a night like no other at the Oscars, Anthony Hopkins is the oldest Best Actor winner at the age of 83. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, the return of the Invincibles. Arsenal legends Thierry Henry, Dennis Bergkamp and Patrick Vieira all join a bid to buy the club. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at six. Sources have said to the BBC that as England went into a second lockdown last autumn, the Prime Minister said he would rather see bodies pile high than take the country into a third lockdown. The Prime Minister denies it. The government was criticised for delaying the lockdown during which tens of thousands more people died. Labour say the Prime Minister has degraded his office and that his comments are a disgrace. It comes amid a storm of allegations against the Prime Minister by his former closest aide Dominic Cummings and a growing row over who paid for the refurbishment of the Prime Minister's Downing Street flat. Here's our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. Politics is not just a game, but a constant back and forth over the most serious of decisions. Boris Johnson's alleged, in the autumn, to have made the most serious of remarks, suggesting around the time of the second lockdown that the bodies of those dying of coronavirus could just pile up. Did he? No, uh, but uh, again, I think the important thing I think that people want to, uh, us to get on and do as a, a government is to make sure that the, the lockdowns work. Yet back in early autumn, it was tense. Ministers and advisers divided over whether to lock down again as coronavirus rose. After arguments, Boris Johnson did agree to reintroduce restrictions. You must stay at home. You may only leave home for specific reasons. But several sources familiar with private conversations at the time say the Prime Minister did then suggest he would let bodies pile high in their thousands rather than repeat the process again. At the time... Dominic Cummings was by Boris Johnson's side. Now the Prime Minister's former chief advisor is very firmly out of government and very firmly on the warpath. There's a list of dangerous claims stacking up at Downing Street's door, not just about the Prime Minister's attitude during the pandemic, but about how contracts were awarded, what promises he made, and how and who paid for an expensive makeover of the Downing Street flat where he lives above the shop. Theresa May gave a rare glimpse of the flat in her last week in office, but the pink sofas and beige carpets were moved out. Thank you very much. When Boris so Johnson and his fiancée moved in, exactly it's claimed Tory donors initially picked up the tab for tens of thousands of pounds of renovation. If so, that should have been declared, and that hasn't happened yet. And the most senior civil servant in the country wasn't willing to shed much light on it for MPs this afternoon. I asked you whether you were aware whether or not any private donations had been used to re refurbish the flat. I mean, that's a straightforward yes or no, really. So, um, uh, as I said, the Prime Minister has asked me to uh, conduct a review into how, uh, how this has been done and asked that I share the details of those conclusions with, with the committee. After months of claims, Downing Street now says the Prime Minister paid out of his own pocket, but we don't know when or where he got the money. 
for the opposition. Sparks flying in Downing Street are a political gift. We've got lots of investigations going on, but we haven't got anything that's looking at the pattern of behaviour. And day after day, there are new allegations of sleaze, of favours, of privileged access. We need a full investigation that can get to the bottom of that and, most importantly, make recommendations about change, because we need to change the rules. Boris Johnson's sometimes been proud of pushing political convention. Downing Street is adamant that in all senses regulations were followed, but with a long list of claims against him, it isn't yet clear if he was always following the rules. Laura, questions on so many fronts for the Prime Minister. How much trouble is he in? Well, Fiona, I think that this is very tricky territory indeed for the government, not just because of the nature of the stories that have emerged today, but because we've got into a political pattern where day after day other things seem to be coming. There's a sense almost that it's a bit like open season on the government in terms of people who may or may not have an agenda wanting to get things out there in the open that may in some circumstances be quite harmful to the government and Boris Johnson's administration. We should also say Downing Street has repeatedly said that on all of these many different fronts they are sure that nothing was wrong. But there has been a sense, perhaps until the last sort of 24, 36 hours, that for most voters, people know that Boris Johnson is somebody who has sometimes been proud of the idea that he bucks convention, that he does things in a different way to other politicians. And many Conservatives I've talked to have suggested that somehow any of the flaws or any of his misbehaviour might somehow be priced in. But there is the odd hint here and there that that confidence is really starting to change. Some of the serious questions that have been posed have not yet been given full answers. And one cabinet minister said to me, the real concern is that there's nothing they can do to control it. And no one can be tonight quite sure what or when something else would emerge. Laura at Westminster, thank you. The British Iranian aid worker Nazneen Zaghari Ratcliffe has been sentenced to a further year in prison in Tehran on charges of propaganda against the regime. Last month, she completed a five-year sentence following spying charges, raising hopes she'd be allowed home to join her daughter and husband in the UK. The Foreign Secretary says the further jail term is inhumane and wholly unjustified. Our World Affairs correspondent Caroline Hawley is here. Caroline, this must be a massive blow to the family, to her husband, her daughter. You must be thinking, is she ever going to come home? I spoke to Richard Ratcliffe this afternoon. He had been expecting a guilty verdict, but he says this is worse than they'd feared. A one-year sentence, and then subsequent to that, another year of a travel ban. So they're looking at possibly not seeing her till 2023. Um, of course, they had been desperately hoping she'd be freed in March when that five-year sentence was finished. But Richard said to me, the goalposts keep changing, and they're not sure how they're going to break it to six-year-old Gabriella. So if the golfers keep moving, how, I mean, is there any sign that this stalemate can be resolved? That is such a difficult question. The family is really caught in a geopolitical quagmire and nightmare. Richard has always said that she's being held as collateral for a long-standing military debt that the UK owes to Iran. But now he says that he believes her fate is also tied to negotiations in Vienna over trying to revive Iran's nuclear deal with the outside world, whereby it would comply with the nuclear deal in return for a lifting of sanctions. Very, very complicated. Now, Boris Johnson has said that the UK will redouble its efforts to get her home and will be working with the Americans on that. But he also said it was wrong that she's been given this second sentence. It was wrong that she's being held in the first place. At the moment, she's still at her parents' home and nobody knows if, when, she'll actually go back into jail. OK, Caroline, thank you. The Indian government says there's no need to panic, despite doctors saying people are dying in the streets, and as desperate families try to buy oxygen on the black market as hospitals run out. The country is struggling with record coronavirus infections. More than 350,000 have been recorded in the past day. Our India correspondent Rajini Vajinathan reports. In Gujarat, it's come to this. A hired van, now a makeshift ambulance. With no doctors available, Manoj Singh Shekhavat is doing all he can to save his aunt himself. People have been left to fend for themselves as India's healthcare system crumbles. It's a horror story on repeat. In Delhi, Animesh Kumar waits outside this hospital with his relative. 
We've been to a few, but they won't admit him, he said. We're standing here without oxygen in the middle of the road, without any hope. Hope is in short supply, but some help is on its way. Ventilators and oxygen concentrators from the UK government are due to land in Delhi tonight. Even regional rivals Pakistan and China have put aside their differences with India as they join the list of countries pledging help. But it's not nearly enough to meet demand. Health experts say the peak is weeks away and fear that case numbers could triple. There's a lot of suffering going on in India at the moment. What do your projections say for how long this will continue? There is a lot of suffering. In fact, uh, I think every family is grieving because there's someone in every family who has died. The current projections are this will go on for a while longer, probably another three to four weeks before we see a peak and a reversal. Uh, I have no idea how the system is going to cope. And in the UK, some doctors are also lending a hand. Dr Ashok Jaina from Coventry runs a medical charity in India. He's been taking hundreds of calls from patients in rural areas. I remain so frightened, anxious, because environment is so frightening. They say, doctor, save our life. My mother is gasping. My mother is not able to breathe. What to do? These fires will keep on burning. Mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, friends and colleagues. How many more lives will be claimed? And could more have been done to save them? Regini Vaidyanathan, BBC News. Here the latest government figures on coronavirus show 2,064 new infections in the latest 24-hour period, which means an average of 2,309 new cases per day in the last week. There were 1,781 people in hospital with coronavirus over the seven days to last Thursday. Six deaths were recorded in the last 24 hours of people who'd had a positive COVID-19 test within the previous 28 days. These figures are often lower on a Monday. The average number of deaths per day in the past week is 23. The total number of UK deaths is now 127,434. 79,695 people have received a first vaccine dose in the latest 24-hour period and a total of just over 33,750,000 people have now had their first jab, while the number of people who've had their second dose of the vaccine in the latest 24-hour period is 260,801. And that brings it to a total of 13 million have had their second dose. Around half a million 44-year-olds in England are being invited to book their COVID jab as the vaccine rollout continues. The NHS said it would set out when 40 to 43-year-olds would be eligible in the coming days as vaccine supply allows. Our health correspondent Sophie Hutchinson reports. A large vaccination centre at Wimbledon Football Club in southwest London today. Staff here say they've had a rush of younger people booking appointments as 44 year olds were invited for vaccines in England for the first time. It's just fantastic to know that there's more cohorts coming through. Um, people then are, you know, offered vaccination. That means safety. But why has the vaccination programme only opened up to a single new year group this time, 44-year-olds, instead of everyone in their 40s? Well, one answer may be found here. Although the number of doses being given remains relatively stable, hundreds of thousands of people are now being prioritised for their second jabs, seen here in dark blue. The danger is if we extend that period between the first and the second vaccination, so the so-called prime and boost, that we might um, have a situation where the protection really goes down. That's the, um, the why it's so important to have that second dose. Another challenge is that people in their 40s make up a vastly larger age group than any of the older groups who've already been invited for vaccinations. There's no doubt that the rollout of the UK's vaccination programme has been rapid. Already, 90% of people at risk of dying of COVID-19 have received one dose. The big question is, will the younger generation who are at less risk of coronavirus be as enthusiastic for the jab?
The good news is that vaccine hesitancy seems to be falling in Great Britain. Figures comparing February with March show in young people who are among the most sceptical it dropped from 17 to 12 per cent, and in the black population it halved from a high of 44 per cent to 22. And to ensure as many younger people as possible are vaccinated, this government advert is running for the first time today. 35 to 39-year-olds have now been invited for vaccination in Northern Ireland. NHS England says a decision on all 40-year-olds will be made in the next few days based on factors such as vaccine supplies. Sophie Hutchinson, BBC News. Time is a quarter past six, our top story this evening. Sources have told the BBC the Prime Minister said he would rather let thousands of bodies pile high in the streets than have another lockdown. Coming up at the Oscars, the coveted Best Picture Award goes to Nomadland. Coming up in Sports Day on the BBC News Channel, more players pull out of cricket's Indian Premier League as Covid cases continue to surge in the country, with concerns growing that the tournament may not be able to be completed. There's been a further easing of lockdown in parts of the UK. After four months, Scottish restaurants, pubs and cafes are welcoming back customers. And unlike the rest of the UK, they can open indoors, but only until eight o'clock in the evening. And alcohol will be served only to customers seated outside. Non-essential shops, gyms and swimming pools are also reopening. And travel restrictions have been relaxed, allowing trips to other parts of the UK. Our Scotland correspondent, Lorna Gordon, reports. Scotland is reopening for business. After so many months of shuttered shops and closed doors, colour, cash and people are returning to the streets. For some, today means family reunions. Well, it's coming to see my granddaughter, who I haven't seen for two years. And this was the day I thought, right, get on a train. Scotland is now open for visitors. Where have you come from? Lancaster. For others, it's a chance to celebrate with friends. We've all taken a day off and the following day so we can uh, revel in Edinburgh's brilliant hospitality. Scotland's not exactly been known for its outdoor dining culture, but Covid is changing all that and today feels like a big step back towards normality. Cheers! Outside as well as indoors, hospitality is restarting here, but the Scottish Government says the risk of transmission is greater inside, so strict controls remain in place. The industry disputes this. Nick Wood, who runs over 20 venues, says the restrictions mean it's too financially challenging for some to reopen straight away. At the moment I, can, I can't serve alcohol inside and I have to shut inside at 8 o'clock. Outside I can serve alcohol till 10. Until we can serve alcohol indoors there's a huge amount of our venues that just won't be viable at all. All retail in Scotland can now reopen. After months away from the till, staff in this shop just glad to be back at work. It was a bit like waking up from a long nap. Kind of everything's a bit like relearning how to just work in a shop again. It's a bit sort of strange, but also very nice. It's a um, familiar space. Guest houses, B&Bs, hotels and campsites are ready to welcome back visitors. In this, the biggest push to open Scotland's economy since this latest lockdown started easing. For many, though, it will still be a soft start. I do have somebody coming in today, uh, later on, and then it's a slow trickle. And in the middle of May, when the restaurants can then more, I think they're allowed to serve alcohol indoors, that's when I've got more bookings. Rules on masks and social distancing remain, but this is still a big change to life in Scotland, and all going well, further easing has planned for the months ahead. Lorna Gordon, BBC News, Edinburgh. In Wales, lockdown restrictions are also being eased for outdoor activities. Pubs, cafes and restaurants can reopen to customers, allowing up to six people from six different households to sit outside. Attractions such as zoos and theme parks have also opened, and a maximum of 30 people can attend outdoor receptions for weddings and funerals and take part in organised sports. Our Wales correspondent, Hal Griffith, has the latest. In three, two, one... Launching out of lockdown and into business, this new zip wire in Aberdeer welcomed its first ever customers this morning after what's been a bumpy ride, having to change their opening date several times. Colin was one of the first down the line. Absolutely awesome. Oh, that was fabulous. 
I thought it might have been a bit faster than it was, but it was brilliant. Built on the site of an old coal mine, this Ipwayo was originally meant to open in July last year, but the pandemic kept pushing plans further and further into the future until today finally arrived. They are now fully booked for the next three weeks. I really, really think that people are going to enjoy this. That's welcome news for Caitlin, who's been desperate to start her new job. I'm really excited, like I didn't really sleep last night because it's one of those things where everyone is just going to be rushing in really excited. High spirits and plenty of wine and beer too as pubs and cafes around Wales started up outdoor service again. <laughs> After months of meeting online it was a chance for Sophie and her colleagues to see each other face to face again and not worry about pressing mute. It just feels a bit less forced and you know when we're talking online it normally is about work and stuff um, but in you know you get to spend a bit more time getting to know people personally outside and so when i've been chatting to you online you've been forcing it yeah it's been a bit, it's been a bit forced oh, it's fantastic it's been a really long winter um so we were last out i think in december november time so uh yeah coming back out in the uh, in the sunshine as well it's fantastic this is your first rodeo the weather has so far been kind to those who make their living outdoors a sudden drop in temperature could cool demand, but for now there's little to dampen the exhilaration of being open at last. Howell Griffith, BBC News, Aberdeen. The former chief executive of the post office has given up her public roles following the IT scandal, which led to the wrongful convictions of former postmasters. Paula Vanells is stepping down from the boards of Morrison Supermarket and home furnishing shop Dunelm. She's also withdrawing from her work as an ordained minister in the Church of England. A case brought by the Serious Fraud Office against two former executives as the private security firm Serco has collapsed after the SFO declined to offer evidence against them. It's the latest in a series of cases where the SFO hasn't been able to secure a conviction. A judge ordered that Nicholas Woods and Simon Marshall be acquitted. They had been accused of concealing £12 million in profits from electronically tagging criminals. Two former paratroopers have gone on trial for the murder of a man in Belfast nearly 50 years ago. Joe McCann, who was 24, was a member of the group known as the Official IRA. Our Ireland correspondent Emma Vardy reports from Belfast. Well, the prosecution of former British soldiers who were stationed here in Northern Ireland during the 30 years of conflict uh, known as the Troubles is a very emotive and controversial issue. And today we saw two former paratroopers coming back to Northern Ireland appearing here in court where they entered not guilty pleas in relation to that incident which happened uh, nearly five decades ago. Now, in court, they are referred to as Soldier A and Soldier C. And the circumstances were that in 1972, they were on patrol in Belfast when police asked for help to uh, bring about the arrest of Joe McCann, who was known to be a member of the official IRA. But when he ran away, the soldiers opened fire and Joe McCann was killed. Uh, now, the prosecution's argument in this case is that shooting uh, was not justified to bring about the arrest or for self-defence, uh, while the defence case is that that use of force uh, was was reasonable. Now, also here at court today, there was the former government defence minister, Johnny Mercer MP, who had left the government uh, over the treatment of veterans. He believes that former soldiers should be protected from prosecutions like these, while at the same time there are many victims, relatives groups in Northern Ireland who believe cases like these are an important part of dealing with the past. And this case uh, is due to last for about the next four weeks. Emma in Belfast, thank you. Serious concern about rugby players who've gone on to suffer permanent brain damage has been growing in recent years. Now, dozens of former elite players, including Wales' record try scorer Shane Williams and England's World Cup winner Ben Kay, have joined a study looking into the early warning signs of dementia. Some footballers are also going to be monitored as part of research by the Alzheimer's Society. Our health editor, Hugh Pym, reports. Yep. Rugby's a contact sport, and this is just a training session. The amateur team London Scottish Lions preparing to start playing for real as lockdown eases. There are strict protocols to deal with concussion and head injuries, but in previous decades there was less awareness of the risks 
An Alzheimer's Society study will monitor the brain health of retired top-level players. Taking part will be Ben Kay, part of England's World Cup winning team in 2003. As someone that, that will undoubtedly have suffered head trauma, mild head trauma while I was playing rugby, if I can be part of the process that examines how that might affect not just sports people, but anyone who's suffered head trauma uh, in their life at some point, um, then absolutely I want to throw my weight behind it. 50 retired elite players aged between 40 and 59 will be added to an existing study with people from the wider population in that age group. They'll have scans and other tests every two years. The condition of the rugby players will be assessed against the rest of the group. Are you OK there, Shane? Yeah, good, thanks. The former Welsh international Shane Williams is already part of the study. His brain scans were shown in a BBC Wales documentary last year on rugby and concussion. There was that, always that fear of what were they going to find on the on the on these scans, really. But um, you know, I'm so glad I've done it. I'm so glad that I can take part in this study because if I can help people moving forward, then you know I've done something right. A few former footballers, including Alan Shearer, will be included in the new study. Dawn Astle's father, Jeff, died with dementia. Heading a football was listed as a cause. She says the authorities should have started research much sooner. This is irreparable brain damage, you know, and footballers uh, are dying because of it. And for far too long, uh, certainly we feel, certainly, you know, the family of my dad, that it was, it was been swept under a carpet. World Rugby, which runs the global game, said it continually reviewed evidence to ensure the best possible player outcomes. The Football Association said a new concussion substitute policy came from doctors working in the game. But players of both sports believe a lot more ground needs to be covered to give them more understanding of the risks. Hugh Pym, BBC News. After an Oscar ceremony like no other, the biggest winner of the night was the film Nomadland, with its director Chloe Zhao becoming the second woman to be named Best Director and the first of Asian descent. Sir Anthony Hopkins also became the oldest Best Actor winner at 83, while Daniel Kaluuya is the first black British actor to win an Oscar in the supporting category. Our arts editor, Will Gomberts, has more. The Oscars 2021 pulled into LA's Union Station for a pandemic-era show, a live event presented a bit like a movie. But the script lacked surprises. There was a stumbled start by nominee and guest presenter Regina King. Oh, live TV, here we go. The mood was more low key art house rather than Hollywood blockbuster. Fitting then that Nomad Land, an elegiac film about a widowed woman seeking solace on the open road, was the night's big winner. Its writer director, Chloe Zhao, became only the second woman in the Oscars' 93-year history to win the Best Director Award. This is for anyone who has the faith and the courage to hold on to the goodness in themselves. The film's star, Frances McDormand, took home the leading actress Oscar, the third in her career. And then, when the film won Best Picture, told millions of TV viewers to go to the movies. Take everyone you know into a theater, shoulder to shoulder, in that dark space, and watch every film that's represented here tonight. The 83-year-old Sir Anthony Hopkins became the oldest ever leading actor Oscar winner for his remarkable performance as an old man with dementia in The Father. Oh, I was a dancer. Were you? Yes. Dad? What? You were an engineer. What do you know about it? Yes, tap dancing was my specialty. He chose not to attend, which was another blow to an underwhelming show. Still, he was delighted, as he said in a video posted on social media today. Again, thank you all very much. <laughs> I really did not expect this. So, I feel very privileged and honoured. Thank you. Daniel Kaluuya was another British success, picking up the Best Supporting Act Oscar for his portrayal of Fred Hampton, Chicago's Black Panther leader in Judas and the Black Messiah. You can't murder liberation. To Chairman Fred Hampton, what a man. How blessed we are that we lived in a lifetime where he existed, do you understand? Emerald Fennell, familiar to many as Camilla Parker Bowles in The Crown, continued a good night for the Brits by winning the Best Original Screenplay Oscar for her revenge drama, Promising Young Woman. Oh my God, he's so heavy and he's so cold. I'm gonna put him down. 
Best Supporting Actress went to Ye Jong Young, who played the mischievous grandma in the gently paced American dream movie Minari. Hollywood will be hoping next year's Oscars will be celebrating films seen at the cinema rather than on a TV at home. That in a world of streaming, people will still feel the magic of going to the movies. Will Gompertz, BBC News. Let's take a look at the weather with Susan Powell. Hi, Susan. Thank you, Fiona. Finally, some rain in our forecast. It's been so dry in recent weeks. A lot of evening sunshine and fine weather out there at the moment, but low pressure has been progressing across Scotland through the day today. Tomorrow, it slides a little bit further south and it will take the chance of rainfall along with it into the southwest by Wednesday. A greater chance of seeing some showers here then and then across towards the southeast and East Anglia for Thursday. The rain comes in the form of showers, though, so somewhat hit and miss. Some areas will see the old heavier downpour. Some areas won't see very much at all. Drier spells in between the showers. But the clouds spilling south over the UK tonight does make for a milder night, aside from across counties of southern England and East Anglia, where there will be a frost again to start Tuesday. Best of our sunshine here through Tuesday, our highest temperatures as well. Perhaps just the odd shower into the southwest through the afternoon. Further north, though, and you can see uh, the showers are more widespread, but they will be quite broken up. Not all areas seeing the wet, but uh, the wettest conditions, I think, will be along the North Sea coast with an onshore breeze for eastern Scotland and the northeast of England. Looking much clearer here for Wednesday. The showers tending to focus on Wales, the Midlands and the southwest. Could be some really heavy ones actually running across southern England, getting into the southeast Wednesday afternoon into the evening. The cold air to the north means temperatures just 9 degrees in Aberdeen, 14 further south. There's that low bringing some rain finally for the southeast and East Anglia on Thursday. And then by Friday, the lows off into the continent. The isobars open up, the wind falls light, the skies will be largely clear by night. We are going to see widespread frosts once again, and we could see uh, uh, some showers, but they should be more isolated than early on in the week. So some rain to come in the short term, but still looking drier, but chillier for the end of the week. Fiona. Susan, thanks very much. That's all from the BBC News at 6. It's goodbye from me. And on BBC One, we can join the BBC's news teams where you are. Bye-bye.